good morning, or after, actually uh, good noon, almost, almost time for lunch. Um, my name is Joel, Joel Kaczmarek. I'm uh, from uh, Digital Compact, a, a small online magazine dealing with your business or our business here. And I have the pleasure to talk to these five guys here. Um, I learned that quite a few people had a pre-Noah party yesterday and a little bit wasted yet. Um, as you can hear of my voice, it's a little bit the same with me, but nevertheless, we're totally motivated. Um, we're speaking about attention today. The, the idea of our panel is, how am I doing branding and marketing and sales in an economy where everything happens in a glimpse, right? Where nobody has time, where everyone is checking their mobile phones and has just five minutes to, to interact. And these four guys here are experts in the field each. Um, I think I'll introduce you guys just very briefly and fast. To the very right, we have David, David Kuczek. He is a general partner at Holzbrick Ventures. So his business is basically investing. And I think he sees a lot of marketing spending overviews. So um, happy to have you here. Um, then comes Philip Meixner. He works for Seven Ventures and is the investment director. So basically media and branding is his business. Really curious, curious about your ideas on, on TV and, and mobile and all, all this stuff. Then we have Matthias Riedel from DCMN. His job is basically selling drugs over the internet. No, just kidding. He has an uh, information agent. Do not look too groomy to me. <laughs> um, he basically has a media and communication agency, and he just told me that he did this great TV spot with uh, Bastian Schweinsteiger. You know that one where he's a, a, um, a knight in, a, in, in this, this big thing, and he told me that he shot with like 300 people in Scotland and had the uh, cameraman from James Bond, so I'm really curious about this as well. And last but not least, we have uh, Jörg Gabisch. His job is uh, to, to help you whenever you're hungry. He's the uh, founder and uh, managing director of Livarando. Now takeaway. So a warm welcome to all of you guys. And um, I tried to divide this topic of branding in a, a short attention economy into four different pillars. I tried to think in, in contradictions in a way. And the first contradiction I would like to start off with is brand versus performance. Because as you can imagine, startups are usually very performance orientated. They try to measure everything. They love CPO deals. And yet there is branding which becomes more and more important. And obviously, I would love to uh, start with Philip, because uh, his, his business, in a way, is about branding. Um, how do you see this contradiction? I mean, as I said, many startups focus on, on performance, try to measure everything, and yet brand seems to become more and more important. Um, well, Joel, first of all, I don't think that um, it's a contradiction or um, that uh, brand and performance oppose each other. It's more that... Um, if you have a brand, you actually have a competitive advantage on the performance side. Just um, if you go in a fully competitive market um, and you just buy ads, like Google ads, for example, you squeeze out the last margin point um, of your offer, which typically leads to, like, um, for you, a not very profitable business. And if you have a brand, actually, you buy much cheaper. Um, you have different search uh, on, your, uh, on your keywords. You have more brand-related search. So in the end of the day, um, brand is a stimulator for your performance. So um, taking it from there, I would always say um, those things are rather extensions than opposing measures. And um, if you have a good campaign, you actually should head for sure for performance, but you shouldn't forget uh, putting a lot of effort on your brand building because in the long term, it really turns out into a good ROI. What's your experience with startups? I mean, uh, you guys basically do, do ads in TV, right? And a, a startup normally is used to measuring everything. Now you can say, okay, this many people watched the ad, or it was this and that successful in different respects at different times, but basically brand is a non-measurable value in a way, or hardly measure, measurable. Isn't this a problem sometimes? Um, well, there are means you, you can measure uh, the value out of a brand. Um, for example, if you just see um, the, the traffic you, you generate out of television, which is pretty much brand related, uh, you just see an immediate uplift um, just shortly after an ad is aired. Then, of course, you see a change in the search pattern, which is much more going towards uh, brand-related uh, keywords, which uh, you buy at a much lower price, of course, than those branded keywords in the long tail. And um, you could add this as a value um, on the brand. So it's pretty much a loyalty. You don't have to pay because um, you, you dictate uh, the search terms. What, what's the main focus of brand anyway? I mean, I learned from founders that they do TV first to create awareness, that people know their brand. I think, yeah, like, like he does. If you think of pizza, think of Liverando. But then there's also people buying on a, on a regular basis, like repeated purchases. So what are basically the main, the main goals if, when creating a brand? 
Well, the main goal for a brand is, of course, um, being on top of the mind share, so being in the relevant set. And I can tell you, it's, it's impossible, for example, for Heinz Ketchup to sell like a billion bottles a month just with hashtags or like viral campaigns. It wouldn't work. You really have to be um, permanently present and uh, at the point of sales, you have to be the, the one relevant choice. How about you, Jörg? I mean, you basically did this. I, I saw these big billboards at, at, at Zoologischer Garten, really funny ones, like nice word games dealing with, with food and also TV. Um, is he right? What's your perspective on brand versus performance? Yeah, I think, first of all, you have to differentiate. I mean, performance deals, to me, is more like sales. You know? And that really differentiates to marketing, because to me, marketing is building a brand and building a sub sustainable brand value, equity value for your company. So if I look at uh, our company, for example, we're a marketplace. So there's not a lot where you can actually differentiate to competition. It's probably product, it's the variety of restaurants you have, it's the consumer relationship, but in the end it also comes down to brand. And there we're actually measuring top of mind brand awareness. Because if you think about yourself, uh, you're hungry, you want to order food straight away. And then you ask yourself, okay, what's top of my mind? And then you go to that brand which is top of your mind. 80% of Germans actually do that. They order or they decide to order in that right moment when they're hungry. And, and how do you do it? I mean, uh, as you said, when I think of this whole pizza wars, Delivery Euro basically advertised with these, uh, like the, the NASA guy, right? Uh, ordering food from, from the space station or someone in the prison. You guys have these great billboards, like really, really funny ones. In the end, it's just, you know, as you said, both of them had like around like 7,500 restaurants or 9,000. This doesn't count in the end. I mean, right? It, it doesn't, doesn't matter that much. So what was your trick then to become more, like make, make people become more aware of your brand? I mean, first of all, we really focused on just one brand. That's also differentiating us to competition who have a couple of brands. So as a consumer, if you perceive our brand everywhere, while the competition is spreading it over multiple brands, you think we are all over, while competition might even spend a similar amount or even more than we do. That's the first thing. Secondly, uh, we're trying to be consistent across channels. Like the campaign we have right now actually is consistent across all different type of channels. So it's consistent in TV, outdoor, uh, uh, display. So wherever you see us, you always have the same concept. And I think that's very important for the consumer to recognize our brand again. Matthias, uh, consistency was also a, a topic I thought about. How do you manage such stuff? I mean, as he said, you have billboards, you have TV ads, maybe you go to the radio station, then you have SEM, you have display, you have Facebook. Actually, I think there's an agency for each of these ones, but not one that's like, like complementary. How do you deal this? Like a great marketing mixture? How do I create it? Um, so, I think what, what you're talking about is like when the whole thing started, like bringing startups into TV, that like Salanda was kind of the first big success case. Uh, everybody was like, okay, I want to kind of measure TV like I want to measure a performance channel. That's also how we started uh, to go into that business. Um, but what we realized now during the last year that uh, the digital brands um, moving away from looking um, only on one channel. So, uh, so two years ago, companies came to us and said, I want to do TV and I want to make it great. <laughs> so right now they're coming and saying, okay, I have this and this problem or challenge, I want, I want you guys to solve it. I don't really care if you need TV out of home or mobile, whatever for it. And that's um, where we realize what comes there into brand, uh, when it comes into brand or then also because performance is kind of relevant for all digital brands. Everybody wants to have this immediate return on investment or at least calculate it. Um, what we realize is that, okay, we need to understand and invest more in creativity of a campaign because there, some, some, everybody talked a lot about the last years of media, but it's essential how if I communicate in a way um, that people understand it, if it's in TV, radio, uh, mobile, I think creativity will, will be, uh, uh, there will be a new kind of people rediscover creativity because in, it was only, okay, I want a t TV, okay, I need a TV spot that kind of works in terms of performance, response rates, cost back decisions. Um, but now it's really like, okay, um, I, I really want to 
have the whole the whole package um, in terms of an understand if I invest in creativity um, that I differentiate also from my competition because otherwise it would be only okay uh, the competition A spends 10 million competition two spends five million and competition three two million and then it would be kind of the then the kind of placement would be set but creativity I think there will be a kind of a, a new evolution revolution for, for creative campaigns I had the impression that it's sometimes really difficult. You could spend $1 million on, a, on an ad campaign. It might be great, and it might suck totally. I mean, the, 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 the example with Schweinsteiger, it's pretty cool in a way. But often it happens that other guys also get a VIP for their campaign, and it doesn't work at all. So is there some kind of rule when, when doing branding? Um, it is. Um, so that's how we got basically into creation, because in the beginning we just, like, we're kind of a media agency who wants to understand if you spend this amount uh, uh, of money in media, what, what is coming back. And basically we realized uh, that uh, uh, after one campaign where a very famous creative agency was involved and kind of the results were kind of not there, um, okay, there must be something uh, uh, which has to be tweaked in the creative part. Um, so, and we, we realized uh, so that was now five years ago that digital brands normally are exciting on themselves because they have a disruptive business model um, they have kind of interesting people uh, 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 working there and um, in the beginning was like okay explaining just explain the product to the people and explain the advantage you have there and then make a strong call to action and then it kind of uh, uh, worked in terms of uh, a return on investment. How about VIPs, by the way? I was meeting all these different madras startups, so they all sell madrasses. Yeah, it's, it's a madras, you sleep on it. And then you have Bruno and Eve and Sleeps and I don't know, Casper from the US. And I asked one of these guys, hey, why don't you work with a testimonial? And he came up with uh, Vladimir Klitschko for whatever reason. I asked him to take this um, Teppich Luda from, from the, uh, Tita Bohlen. But then I thought, hey, like, is there a case or is it, is it always working to use a VIP to do marketing, to create a brand and then in the end uh, boost performance? That's also a case how, how you do the creative because um, you have the, uh, just this example about uh, ING Diba. Ne? Everybody thinks it's the Dirk Nowitzki brand uh, or the Dirk, Dirk Nowitzki bank because everybody want, wants to, uh, that's basically an example where the, uh, the testimonial is going over the brand. I think it's very, important if you use a VIP or a testimonial that it kind of serves the brand um, or also that the creative idea you use is still very strong and it could even work without this VIP so, so, so you can make sure that still the brand is kind of the number one and not that you making you pay someone for making kind of and you make advertising for for him. <laughs> yeah, I guess it's, it's kind of a science, I can totally imagine. Uh, David, as I said, you're pretty much a numbers guy, I would guess, and you see a lot of Excel sheets uh, talking about marketing spendings. What's your view on this? If a startup hands in their, their, their marketing KPIs and says, hey, we're investing in brand or in performance, what do you look for as an investor? I think the, the landscape completely changed in the past uh, years. Uh, I mean, uh, I think the best example um, is probably West Wing which we funded in a ver very early stage. They basically spent millions on, 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 uh, um, uh, on traditional marketing, performance marketing. And I met uh, Stefan a couple of days ago and he says, you know what, um, uh, I'm not really sure what, you know, what my outcome would have been if I invested everything into content, you know, which they increasingly do. You know, they, they play basically, I think he forced all of his um, employees to, to get a Snapchat account and they're really playing around a lot with, with content and uh, somehow trying to measure it, but he's even getting away from, from measuring. He says, you know, um, uh, especially home and living, especially in, in, in their area where they have a lot of own brands that are unknown, you know, they need to somehow reach and emotionalize the, the, the customer. It's usually female. The buyers are, I think, around uh, between 35 and, and 50. 
and he's really considering switching his complete uh, strategy because he said um, 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 the results that I now have, you know, from brand awareness, which are increasingly tracking, are looking uh, uh, great, especially since comparable to Zalando, when nobody did TV and you're the one that is doing it increasingly well and very professional, also tracking it professionally, you have an advantage in the beginning. I mean, now today, and that's what you also see at, at ProSieben, you know, the, the, the conversion rates uh, for the 20th, you know, shoemaker or travel campaign is, uh, is going down. So I think it's, it's more of really what kind of content do I produce and uh, how do I cater with my brand to, to my consumer? And I think it's, as you said, it's getting more and more creative and, and that's why uh, they kicked out a lot of number guys and are employing a lot of um, people from retail connected to brands and have the right feeling. It's, it's, as an investor, it's hard to put it into a spreadsheet. That's why I think at the beginning, nobody cared. And when somebody came to us and said, I want to build a brand, I said, you know, whatever. You know, first do your SEM or whatever straight and get the numbers and put them into the Excel and show them to me. And um, we've seen this uh, not only with West Wing, but also with like Parship uh, that, 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 that got like, the, like a new CEO who, uh, and I talked to some other guys at Holtspring who owned it. He said, I'm not going to, I'm not going to measure. Uh, I think it's, it's uh, a little bit exaggerated. I'm not going to measure anything. I want to put this, uh, this, the great outdoor campaigns and build a brand. And last time I checked on Google Trends, I think they are uh, absolute number one player in, in the dating market. So I, there, there, there is something about it, but it's contradictory dictionary somehow to a numbers guy where you say I want to see the outcome right away and not I want to build a brand which has been a joke for us three years ago or four years ago. I mean as far as I know you also did the, the, the Flixbus deal for Hot Spring and um, the, the, the business model there is in a way everyone thinks when a Flixbus comes that this is one company owning a lot of buses but basically the, the case is they just give the brand and operate the whole procedure but the bus is owned by someone else, like different bus owners that drive for them. And I mean, you have dozens of, of business models with that, like Movinga doing it with uh, moving, uh, Homebe doing it with guys working in your home. Um, probably two, two or more, uh, Karubi with cars. Is this a trend in a way? So did investors also found out that branding and, you know, actually triggering repurchases and high, um, like, like customers coming back often to your business, do, appreciate, do investors appreciate that nowadays? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a huge trend. I mean, we've seen, um, uh, uh, you know, if something um, uh, works out well, you get those, it's like Flixbus for X, Y, Z, you know, and then you see that they somehow did a great job. I think it was more at the beginning of a coincidence. I mean, basically what you have, and that's why I think originally we were invested in Flixbus, but my Fernbus, from my perspective, did a better job on branding because they had the green color. That's why after we merged, we took over the color because I always thought it was superior. It was this far, far green, drive green. It's a very good message um, and so on. And for them, it's um, uh, internally, we say those, uh, uh, the billboards that are driving on the streets or on the autobahns, you know, it's the best commercial plus in com comparison with the one euro, you know, very cheap price plus billboards all over, it has a, it has a huge effect. But um, eventually people see the green, they get used to the product, it's in a, in a price range which is, which is cheap anyway, so the, the changing costs are not really high, so if you pay actually, that's why Megabus, for example, has very hard time on the German market because if you pay either 10 euro, which is our average ticket size at the moment, or one, uh, mathematically it's a huge difference, but for the consumer it completely isn't because he says, you know, I have, I, I, there's like 10 buses going on the streets, I can rebook very easily through my application, I know the standard, I'm not switching. So it's, uh, it sounds absurd, but it's a huge lock-in effect because they got used to the brand. Okay, so we had brand versus performance as the first contradiction, which isn't one, as uh, Philip told me. Now, um, the second contradiction I thought about was uh, just the one you mentioned, actually, content versus advertisement. Uh, Philip, as, as um, David just said, startups turn to go more into content marketing, yet I have the impression that the, the, the mixture in a way is important. What, what's your view on this? I mean, you guys sell a lot of ads, obviously but yet content is also growing. Content marketing is actually, everyone is speaking about content marketing. 
Um, well, I think you, you are right. Um, content is getting more and more important, and the the ads um, are like a very nice base load you have to support a brand to create, like a, I would say, a topic that you direct. You are the director of the topic um, going on the ads, just the plain ads. If you go on talk on content, you uh, you start actually um, enriching your brand, and you kind of create a nice story around this. Um, just on top of what you already um, portray in normal ads. And this is very valuable because brands need to differentiate, need to develop, and this is much easier if you do it with content. If you use, for example, the huge reach an Instagram or a Snapchat has, uh, where you engage on a different level, where you, um, where you share, um, where you like, dislike, and um, this actually gives a, gives a, for you as a brand, a deep insight. So it's like a responsive measure if you do proper content marketing. And on the other hand, of course, um, you can still influence the way you create content from whom it is created, who influences it. And so um, in the end, you really put an on top value to your normal ad uh, strategy. And I think in the long run, you have to um, differentiate through multiple layers and make them kind of harmonize. What I learned also by speaking with you guys, as far as I remember at least, is that not every startup or not every company is TV ready, as I call it in a way. Um, do you have some kind of hurdle rate that a company needs to overcome to, to suit into that? Well, um, TV ready, I would always say, um, is more related to the operations because once you put TV on an asset, um, suddenly like really things go up immediately. So you have an immediate response and if your operations are not ready for that, you actually create a bad customer experience which might be in return be bad for your brand in the long run. So um, we always say have your operations ready, have a product that you actually want to bring on TV, that you are secure, uh, you want to kind of promote your product to a big mass. It shouldn't be a plain tryout product like a better version, it should be ready to be really mass marketized. And then you also should be aware that, of course, now because of social media, there might be a second, uh, like a second stage of um, content uh, around it that is just created that you can't influence too well. So it's important to have a good product. What I ask myself is, I mean, you're a little biased on this way, to be, to be totally fair, because you're basically a TV company. Um, as far as I know, many young people do not have a TV station at all, right? So they, they go on, on, on Snapchat or receive the stuff online, use their mobile. What's your strategy for this? I mean, it totally changes. I can imagine that online advertisement isn't that, that nice from a money perspective, at least as, I, as far as I learned. Um, how will you approach this if the game changes? Okay, we, uh, we do invest in, um, I would say, in a lot of uh, um, those alternative ways um, to kind of distribute content. We can do this through our own online platforms, video platforms, and we also, of course, uh, try to build up own influencers. So in this way, yes, we are aware of that, and of course we are also aware that, especially in this um, target group below the 20, like um, 15 to 20, which is from a branding perspective quite important, they're not really commercially very relevant, but they are very relevant uh, in respect to um, long-term brand affinity, and we know that we have to be very creati creative to get them. And um, of course, we also thinking of the add-on strategies we can do. Uh, still, of course, we have um, quite some TV power uh, also to serve those target groups. They are not gone yet, and um, it's just I would say it's a, a tendency towards uh, like towards the south a little bit, but we still reach them quite well. But who knows how this will be in five years from now? I mean, maybe we could mix this with my third contradiction I had in mind, which is interactive where there's linear, right? TV is pretty much a linear medium, and you had actually all these apps being, being interactive, like Twitch. And I had the impression, I think you guys were the ones buying my video. Yes, exactly, you? you did. And as far as I know, it's being closed, more or less, or it's not that, that big anymore. Is Germany basically losing this game when it comes to transporting TV to the internet and making it more interactive? Um, I would say we, we are not losing it um, because still we have big distributors and we just have to use the right channels around it. And I would, I would say our content is good. Maybe it's, uh, it's not the prime content um, that we create ourselves that you would find in the US, just it's uh, out of the market, uh, it's market driven, but still uh, the content is not that bad that it wouldn't be distributed. We just use different channels. We still have a lot of engagement, for example, on our Facebook uh, platforms. We have, uh, I think, on Galileo, which is a quite famous format, we have around two million uh, fans. So um, we just have to play the right channels in this way to. Um, to kind of get the engagement up.
So the idea sometimes is to get traffic from TV or TV traffic into online services, basically. Yeah, well, this is um, for the whole venture branch and the whole digital business we're doing, this is pretty much the strategy. We now use the power that TV still has to really build up strong uh, online brands. For example, when we bought Verivox, the price comparison, this, it's quite clear that we are building like um, a huge machine here and um, that we will have in the long run a very strong digital brand that won't replace television, but will be again a, a very nice um, digital cornerstone for, uh, for price comparison and um, like for marketplaces for us. Matthias, I saw you pressing your lips uh, on each other. Do you have a different opinion on this? I mean, this is basically your job. No, so, so basically, just what, what I uh, wanted to add here. Um, is it on? <laughs> what I wanted to add here, we see um, the example you said about uh, uh, Galileo is basically funny because a lot of our clients, before they started to invest in TV advertising, they had some kind of a news thing on Galileo and they saw these big spikes on their website and their server crashed. So, <laughs> you, you as well. So, so we kite some of, some of it and then after they saw this impact kind of affect him, then they, they say, oh, I have to do TV advertising and now I see every day this kind of spikes, which is then kind of we always like limit the expectation because a Galileo and that's what the, the thing about content, it's a, it's a very important uh, discussion because if I see a, like, a, like a five minute uh, reportage about a new business model, um, it, the impact is much higher than I have from my, like a t normal 30 second or 20 second TV advertising. But I also uh, want to add something there regarding what we see right now is that a lot of our clients moving um, kind of a logic thing from like not moving away from TV but adding uh, uh, influencer campaigns and use the influencer campaigns like um, like a also performance channel, but with uh, individual created content. And especially for our gaming clients, we are able to track like the customer lifetime value of it, and which is also like kind of then affecting the long-term ROI of, of the brand. And we see that people uh, or users we bring in from this kind of YouTube influencers, they have uh, like a 20% higher customer lifetime value, then we, uh, we bring in like uh, uh, from a normal TV. But so it's not uh, if or that, so because the, the, the YouTube influencer game is like not really scalable right now, there must be more and more. But also you guys have the Studio 71 uh, uh, where I think this is a huge thing which again, uh, it's a like building own unique content and spreading this over different platforms. And people right now, I don't know if this will change or it will go down when it's more a commodity, but right now we see that this is attracting people much more, activating them more and engaging them more. But eventually, I think you're right. I mean, if you, if you uh, um, sum up all the video views on YouTube, Facebook, I don't know how many percent this is worldwide. It's quite a lot. Except maybe China. They have yeah. a, a, a different strategy. Uh, on the domestic market, but it's, it's huge. Um, before Facebook was big, it was probably all YouTube. So this is basically the only chance to get into the game, you know, have like a huge community. Maybe um, um, WhatsApp will start something, maybe um, Snapchat will start something. But other than that, I think it's going to be hu hu uh, very hard to set up a, uh, like a platform for distribution. So I think you have to work for them. You have to do the creative part and you have to some, you are forced to somehow work with them to distribute it. Uh, Jörg, how about you? If you were in the, in the West Wing case he described, starting a business all over again from scratch, would you invest your money in, in content marketing or would you talk to these guys doing a media for equity deal? Actually, I think uh, at the very beginning, as, as was also said, uh, sometimes it doesn't make sense starting straight with TV because we had to build up our network of restaurants first. You need a national coverage and you actually need quite some budgets besides uh, doing a media for equity deal. You still need to pay something for it. But I think having reached and having showed uh, on the performance side that the business model works, that's very crucial. Once you've showed that, then I think it's definitely worth considering uh, to do a media for equity deal. Um, but then you have to consider whether it works for your company. And you have to consider a couple of things, like A, 
how is dispersion going to be like? Am I nationwide? Uh, can I reach everyone? And we are active in a mass market, so for us it was actually a good thing. We didn't have production and logistics because sometimes you might say, I want to have three million gross media that month, but then in the end you only get one and a half. And maybe if you're a company who produces something, then you have something on stock which you can't sell anymore. So there's a couple of considerations depending on the business model you have. But in our case, I would definitely do it again and would definitely do a TV again. But at first, you need to show perform on the performance side that the business model works and the payback periods and so on work. Okay, so scale as soon uh, as you are able to scale, as your operations are, are well done and your business model is, is well known. But the, the, the thing Mat Matthias said, that the, the, the traffic coming from content is more worthful than the content, uh, the traffic from, from ads, is that something you witnessed as well? I mean, you definitely see a, a shift in how marketing works. I mean, as a consumer nowadays, you can choose which advertising you want to see and which you don't want to see and when you want to see and when you are receptive. And obviously, marketing works best when a consumer is receptive. And given the whole trend towards mobile, you're even more independent. So you see emancipation of the consumer. And given that, it's actually important to get the consumer in the right moment. So uh, there's... For example, there are studies which say 150 times per day the consumer goes to his mobile phone and looks for information or to do something or a location and so on. And then you need to be there in that right moment with the right content. But still... Uh, How do you do that? I mean, this is a, a big problem for many companies. Yeah. I mean, uh, programmatic buying is, uh, is, is, is one uh, keyword there. You basically use the information you have about the customer to know what he's interested in. You use maybe external information and technology to, to try to get him in the right moment. But still, I think TV is, is still uh, a very a big tool to actually uh, get the brand running because uh, having said all that, I mean, still in Germany on average, um, the consumer watches more than 200 minutes TV per day on average. And in Poland, for example, one of our markets, it's more than 250 minutes. And even in the target group of 14 to 29, it's still more than 100 minutes. That's more than the average usage of internet, still. Okay, so I learned we shouldn't take uh, TV to the grave too, too early. Um, Less contradiction, mobile versus desktop, as you said already. Um, David, a AVC usually tries to be cutting edge when it comes to such topics. Now, mobile isn't really a big secret anymore, but what's your, your hypothesis? Like, what will happen in that space? I mean, you named Snapchat already. Facebook is doing a lot in mobile. What trend do you see when it comes to marketing, building brands, etc.? I mean, it's, it's, um, it's also like this trajectory that we saw with like brand versus performance, um, that obviously, you know, especially the young uh, target group, I, I mean, they live mobile, you know, like uh, two years ago was the same thing. A lot of companies didn't have mobile um, ready websites. They didn't have apps and, and so on. So at the moment, it's completely crucial. I mean, there's increasingly companies that do mobile only, mobile uh, first. Flipkart, the Amazon of India, they shut down the desktop site. So I think um, what, what you can actually do um, a lot more with mobile, especially apps, is um, have really the direct contact with the consumer. And you don't really have to tunnel everything through Google search engines, uh, but as Amazon is doing, you know, getting the primary product search app and so on. I think you have much quicker access to the consumer and the, the, the interaction immensely increases. So I think a lot of people, especially what we see, are thinking mobile only, mobile first, and really getting deep into um, experiences how to interact with, uh, with, uh, with the customer. The, the interfaces are getting different. I mean, if you see how Google Maps evolved from an interface perspective, it's huge. I mean, uh, it was really shitty back then, and today you really get a lot of information um, uh, right away. Yeah, but it's a tough job. I mean, I, I spoke to quite a few founders, and they say, hey, mobile is so cool to reactivate customers, to increase customer lifetime values, get bigger baskets because of cross-selling. Yet it's also quite, quite hard to do this cross-selling as far as I learned. So mobile has quite different rules in a way. It's much tougher, smaller screen, advertisement doesn't work at all, time spans are shorter. So, I mean, as you said, uh, India is, is a special example as they overjump desktop in a way. So obviously Southeast Asia and all these countries are, are pretty much ahead in that respect. But yet, as you can see, I mean, China, if you think of, of, of um, the, the Chinese WhatsApp, which was called WeChat. It's, it's huge there. So basically, it's, it's pretty hard for a German startup to navigate through all of this hassle. I think it's a, it's a user interface thing. It's a design thing. You know, if you see um, WeChat and how they basically get the platform for everything, I mean, you can do 
money transactions, anything through WeChat. It's, it's the new operating system. They just put themselves on top of Android and uh, funnel every, everything through. So what we see, for example, at West Wing or, or at Flixbus, I mean, the, the, the purchase rate of tickets at Flixbus is going steeply um, above 50%. So people have all of their credentials. They know the steps. The, the core is really getting the product right with this tiny screen and maybe changing screens. So it's like a, a product thing. But in the end, the access to consumer and the quickness, the speed, you know, it's like this one thumb rule. Everything needs to be ready in like 10 seconds, five seconds, one thumb. It's hard to design, but in the end, you get a, a huge payout. Uh, Matthias, how, how do you do, do you do that stuff? I mean, I was speaking to Lezara. They're an online discounter, so they're selling goods like H&M or Inditex, Zara, etc. And he said they have like 75% of their purchases happen mo via mobile, which is huge. But he has the, the, the challenge in a way that his, his target group consists of 40-year-old old ladies or 60-year-old old ladies who do not know to, how to use a mobile phone and 15-year-old girls that try to buy a, a shirt really, really cheap. So actually, there's quite a few of, of, of instances, of aspects in between there. From a, a marketing perspective or agency perspective, how do you deal with mobile as a advertisement and content medium? Um, so there's one, th one thing there when I, so we have an office in San Francisco, and I'm glad that I can also look at apps and like mobile stores basically done in the US versus mobile stores apps done here. So. I think we are very far behind when it comes to mobile usability. So, uh, um, so I have a, a very good example which I really love. Uh, uh, and normally in Germany, the typical thing is you see something on TV, you go on your mobile phone, you Google it, but your purchase you make on your, your desktop computer. That's how it's kind of often, not always. Um, but. There are now companies where I think have, for example, an awesome uh, uh, mobile experience like Morning Glory, for instance. I just bought there my new, new Schaefer thing. But um, the, it's, uh, uh, I think, right now always the thing that people are, especially in Germany, are not used to buy immediately uh, over mobile. And the other thing is that's coming to uh, advertisers because the conversion uh, is not happening on the mobile phone, people uh, on advertisers trying to not are not really pushing uh, advertiser budgets because they're, they they are still in this last cookie wins attribution thing. Um, but what we realized is that a lot of people uh, are in this consideration phase of actually doing a, a purchase. They use like 70, 80 percent the mobile um, and then basically just like the transaction is and there's like kind of the problem that to identify into tracking the user which is like uh, uh, exp uh, trying to get informations on the mobile and then purchasing on the web uh, on the web basically right now there's like only like Facebook and Google who can like follow the things uh, kind of through but uh, this is pretty much something w because advertisers usually are, are very kind of this data tracking driven and as long as you kind of cannot track it and relate it directly to the mobile we will still uh, I think we have our behind of like we should kind of invest more into mobile user experience and also trying to be more brave and trying their channel out and even if we cannot maybe track directly what is the, the impact the direct impact to web um, I'm very, very sure you will see an impact overall. Yeah. I mean, there's a parallel. I mean, 10 years ago, people didn't yeah. want to pay with a credit card on a desktop. Yeah. In the end, it's the same. They are not used to it. The experience is not perfect. Once the experience gets perfect and you feel safe, yeah. it's all going to be done by mobile. Okay. Uh, I want to thank you guys already, but uh, I asked a lot of questions. Do you guys in the audience have any questions? Because we have like three minutes left, more or less. Uh, okay, two. <laughs> Until uh, the, the, the startup track comes. Any questions from you guys? Not all of you at the same time? <laughs> okay. So, so maybe we found the right pillars. Um, we had interactive where this um, linear, we had mobile where this... Uh, Stationary, we had branding versus uh, performance, and the last one I forgot was content versus advertisement. Um, last sentence, you're the, uh, the entrepreneur. What did you learn today? What, what do you take home? 
from all of this? Yeah, I mean, uh, a couple of things. Uh, branding becomes more and more important in a world where actually uh, transparency and comparability of product uh, is available in the internet. Everyone can search on, on, on the internet uh, and compare different products. Uh, so products become more and more alike. And that's why branding uh, becomes uh, and will be staying very important in the future going forward as well. Okay, so thanks a lot, you guys. Thanks a lot of you guys for listening. And um, up next. <laughs>